Madison, New Jersey. And my title is President of Company Generated Business, but essentially what that means is my job is about bringing leads of all different types to our 50,000 plus real estate agents around the country. So I work with relocation leads, with internet leads, affinity group leads, and that's basically how I started in the business 25 years ago and what I still do today. So I also have a great pride of being on the advisory board of this incredible organization, as well as something I am also very proud to share is Realogy, the parent company of many of the brands that you have heard from today, established a LGBT employee resource group two years ago, Real Pride. And so, yeah, huge, thank you. And we've talked about, uh, you heard from Sherry Chris, you heard from Gino this morning about you know, looking at companies' commitments to diversity and inclusion. And so this was a great step for Realogy, and I'm, I'm honored to serve as the executive sponsor for that group at our headquarters in Madison. So I'm just going to very briefly um, tell you, talk a little bit about mass personalization. And even though Sherry Chris and I did not collude on our presentations, it will seem so, because we're coming from the very same place. I want to show you, and again, I work with about uh, the teams, the thousands of agents I work with. You know, we work with over 500,000 leads of different sort every year. And of course, the journey is about getting from those leads to successfully closed transactions and very satisfied customers, right? So I'm going to show you kind of, and I'll use Sherry's language, kind of the real estate 2.0 marketing piece that we still see way too much of, and then a little bit more about what we see is much more effective. Does this look like an effective marketing email to you? But how many, uh, how many tens of thousands of agents are still defining their personal marketing as sending out relatively or sometimes not so cute blanket emails? It isn't personalized. It has nothing about the customer. It has nothing about the agent. And when we talk about mass personalization, what this is about it is about making every time you reach out to a customer, a past customer, or a prospective customer, that in some way, shape, or form, you are personalizing that message to them in some way. So an example of this email. Instead of this is about to go, an agent going out to a customer saying, oh, dear Rachel, I saw that you saved X123 Main Street last night on my website. I saw that property two weeks ago at a broker open. I'd love to answer any questions you had about it. Now, what do you think captures people's attention? What do you think perhaps begins an engagement more? A, a picture of someone holding a clock or an email that, by definition, is specifically designed for you, the prospective customer. Now, for you as agents to be able to do this effectively, and this is where the mass personalization comes in, you know, you can't sit down and write 30 or 40 e individual emails every day. You just don't have time. So it's about, and it has already been discussed, whatever system you use that is going to help you be efficient in reaching out and staying in touch with prospective customers and past customers, but do take the additional time to customize as much as you can to reflect what that person is interested in or what they've done. So when we look at leads and, and successfully converting leads, and I've worked with agents at all levels of their career. We work with new agents beginning. We work with agents who've been very successful for a period of time. We're, we work with the top agents in the respective companies in terms of leads and how do they successfully turn leads and opportunities to customers. So there's three just kind of very short things I want to share with you uh, that I've seen that seem to be kind of universal regardless of your geography, regardless of the price range in which you work, or regardless of how long you've been in the business. One is be aware, and Sherry made a little bit of reference to this this morning, what I mean by this is, I was in the best story I can tell is 
I was, had the honor of working, doing a round table for some top luxury agents in Manhattan uh, last year. And so I was sitting at a table and there wasn't a single agent sitting at the table that generated less than three million in annual GCI on a re regular basis. And so I looked across this table of eight or 10 of agents of that caliber and I just asked them, when is the last time you Googled yourself? And they all looked at me with a blank stare. So I'm not gonna ask you to raise your hands, but I'm gonna ask, I want each of you to ask yourself, when was the last time you Googled yourself? Because even though the majority of your business, most likely, if you have been in the business for a while, even though the majority of your business may come from personal referrals, the thing that has changed in today's world is even if it, uh, the, a past client refers you to a friend of theirs, before they reach out to you, over 85% of the time they are going to research you. So you may not know that how you appear online is actually keeping you from getting personal referrals. Because you know what, if they look you up online and they don't like what they see, they're not gonna place that phone call. They're not gonna reach out. So be aware of how you are presented online. The other thing is be authentic. I know this seems like real estate 101, but in this day and age, it is so much more important than it ever was. The days of stock phrases and I love real estate and I love people and that's why I'm in real estate, they just don't work anymore. You know, in today's world, I'm a firm believer that you know, because of Facebook and because of Instagram and because of a few other applications that some of you in the audience may be a part of, um, it, it, we all believe we kind of are the star of our own reality TV show, right? So you want to have, you want to invite people in that you think are real, that are going to connect with you, and you can only do that if they are authentic. So it's about being current in the information you present. It's about being real. You, no one of us can be all things to all people. So however you want to focus your business, however you want to focus your marketing, however you want to focus your sphere, be authentic. Because it's the other thing about this amazing uh, amount of information that people can find out about you. They can smell BS a mile away. And they also can say, you know what, that person, I like what they have to say about what they do for the people they work with. I think I'm going to give them a shot. So be authentic. And the last thing is, and again, back to Real Estate 101, be the authority. You know, we work with agents all the time and kind of relevant to today's discussion about luxury. And you're going to hear from some you know, very, very successful uh, sales associates with our company about that. But you'll have agents that I'll hear, they'll come to me and say, I really want to get into the luxury market. Or I really want to start selling in another community. Or I really want to start expanding my business geographically. Those are all possible. And those can all be done. But again, because of today's consumer and their expectation, they don't want to be your test case. Right? So if you are wanting to expand your marketplace, however that's defined, geographically, price range, do your research. Be the authority. You know, that means going to broker opens. That means touring the neighborhoods. That means going, putting comments about those properties online. Whatever, whether it be price range or geography, be the authority on what you are presenting to your prospective customers that you, that where you want them to work with you. Smoke and mirrors in today's world don't work. Doesn't mean you can't expand, but you need to put the, the work and the background into it before you move forward. So now we're in, I'd like to, it's my great pleasure to, to move into the panel part of our discussion. And we do have three very successful and different pro professionals coming at this business in a different way that hopefully you, you, I know you will glean a lot from them. And I, the title of our um, presentation and talk, it's really more of a talk, is around building luxury properties into your career. How many of you would like to build more luxury sales into your production on an annual basis? Show of hands, all right? 
I think there were a couple that uh, let their hands down. You know, this is a topic that comes up and, and is addressed in so many different ways, and we, the, the most effective way to give you insights and information is actually to uh, listen to some people who have actually done it and done it incredibly successfully. So we have on our panel today, we have John Nelson and Kat Moe, and all three of our agents, by the way, are with Cobble Banker Residential Brokerage here in Palm Springs in the Coachella Valley. Um, John and Kat, um, we were not going to read the slides to you because I'm a firm believer you can read the slides for yourself in the introduction. Um, but they are, the numbers speak for themselves, top 100 California real estate agents, specialize in the luxury, higher luxury in market, top worldwide 1% of Cobble Banker previews international agents, um, and annual President's Premier Award winners. So, uh, John and Kat, welcome and thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for we also on our panel is Richard Chamberlain. Richard also works and has very successfully worked in this area for 20 plus years, or he's worked in real estate 20 plus years, but I think one thing really interesting uh, and some great insights that Richard brings with his background, he has all his entire career in real estate has always been in second home or vacation home markets. 13 years in Arrowhead and then here working in Palm Springs since 2004, I believe, Richard, right? <clears throat> and one thing Richard is among, again, you know, we're bringing you the cream of the crop here. He's among the top 6% of Cobble Banker previews international agents and his works a little bit differently though, as I think you will find as we get through our discussion and a little bit different focus uh, in how he approaches the business as from John and Kat. So we're gonna get started. Oh, let me go backwards here. So Richard, you know, can you tell us a little bit about, or tell the audience a little bit about just one, this market, the particular market, and some of the nuances here in the, the Coachella Valley and Palm Springs, so that makes it unique and different? Well, I think what makes Palm Springs unique in the valley is the, the buyers are motivated to buy here specifically due to the architecture, the proximity to uh, well-defined neighborhoods of high value, uh, close to LA, close to other regional cities. Whereas further down valley you go, much more fragmented buyers, much less motivation. It's based more on value of the property, well, you know, certainly more so than neighborhood value. There's more of a sense of community in Palm Springs. People move here because they want to be part of a bigger mm -hmm. collaborative community, whereas it's much more detachment. And that clearly is reflective in, the, in, in how powerful the real estate market is in Palm Springs. It's like a niche market versus the rest of the valley that's still tagging far behind. You know, just as we were talking before uh, the session today, and all, from, from all three of you, I learned a great deal about this marketplace. It's such a high percentage of the real estate transactions here are second and third homes. And, and how do you think that impacts how, how you work with this business? And Because I know that wouldn't be true for a lot of the people sitting in this room. Well, if, well from, oh, go ahead, Richard. Go ahead. Well, I, I was just going to say that it's, it's often second, third, fourth, fifth homes, in fact. <laughs> and a lot of people, after spending time here, realize they want to upgrade their second home mm -hmm. to the million dollar price range. Uh, it's kind of a try out period to see what Palm Springs is like for them. And, and Palm Springs is such a unique place. It has a, a, a character specific downtown. Uh, it has a real, uh, you know, sort of, a, a very unique appeal to it that you don't find anywhere else. And as we talked about earlier, I've been selling real estate here for 15 years. And in that 15 years of selling real estate, I have sold five primary residences. Mm -hmm. The rest is second, third, fourth, fifth home. It's true. Okay, did you all get that? I mean, you, John shared this earlier today. I think that's just, that's fascinating. Uh, one of the most successful realtors here, five of the homes were the individual's primary residence. All the rest were second home, vacation home, or as Richard said, fourth or fifth uh, as home or property. The downside about that is that there's no sense of urgency for somebody that's looking for a second, third, or fourth home. So you need to get them while they're hot and ready to write the check. But we have a great world here. Welcome to Palm Springs, you out of towners. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it is interesting, as we were talking about before, that one of the challenges that this marketplace faces, that 
some of you, you know, many markets around the country, this probably is an extreme example, but you know, a lot of markets have both primary you know, home buyers as well as people looking for secondary and vacation homes. And it really, how it really does change the dynamic and it changes the, can change the selling cycle. As you said, there's not nearly as much sense of urgency around it. So one of the very interesting things about this market. So John, can you share with the group just a little bit around how you, I don't want to say got into the luxury market, but as you developed this niche, as your career began in real estate, how did you make that get, become so successful in this particular part of the market? Well, I started out as a new licensee in 1992 with Coal Banker in Beverly Hills. And I'm not one to knock on doors. I'm not one for cold calls. So I figured the best next thing for me was open houses. So I did open houses Saturday and Sundays for years. Um, then in the mid-1990s, the market just stalled. Uh, people weren't buying or selling houses. So I pulled away from the market, and then I found myself living here in the desert. So I did the same thing here, mm -hmm. and that's how it started. And then in addition to that, um, many of you here know Ron DeSalvo from Beverly Hills Coal Banker. He was selling residential real estate here, but he couldn't service the real estate. So I approached him and I said, let's work, let's work out something that's equitable for both of us. And so that was a platform for me here to begin my future here in the desert. Interesting. Bridging and partnering with another agent, as well as in the, what you all educated me certainly about the, the prevalence of open houses here in this marketplace and how important that is in your market here. Right. It's, which I know, again, uh, I live in New Jersey. Open houses are part of the marketplace there, but there are certainly markets around the country where open houses just don't exist, whereas here they are very much a part of it. Critical. So, Kat, um, if you could, and just to you know, share with the group, not only are you and John business partners, but you also happen to be married. And I would think uh, that's not, to, certainly not an unusual situation in real estate. We know there's a lot of straight and gay and lesbian couples who are married uh, or life partners as well as business partners. But I think if you could share with the group how your partnership is so successful, how this works so successfully for you and John, I think that would be helpful. Well, don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> No, no. He, he does what I say. It works out fine. No. Okay. So, Did you know he was going to say that? No. I, didn't. <laughs> okay, I, I can't speak for everyone in the room, but it works great for us. And quite frankly, I wouldn't have it any other way. Uh, I think we all know that. <laughs> I think we all know that we don't have a nine-to-five job, and with our phones and with other communication devices, we're accessible to our clients pretty much all the time and sometimes late in the evening. And I personally can't imagine being out there all day long, working and tending to client needs, and coming home at night and saying, honey, I'm home. Um, I have to change clothes. I'm going to have dinner with someone. Sorry. See you later. <laughs> that probably wouldn't last very long. So uh, a lot of times after transactions, as you know, your clients often become friends and are also part of your social schedule. And that works for us because we don't have that extra pressure uh, as we would have with partners that would have different career paths. Uh, our social schedules, our friends, we share them both. And so it's, it's quite, uh, quite easy that way. Now, I'm not saying that it works for everyone. I always get people saying, um, I would kill my spouse if I worked with them. And I get that. And good for them for recognizing that. Uh, for us, it happens to work. Um, if I have any advice at all, I mean, if you're thinking of working with your partner together, with your spouse together, and you're a little bit unsure about it, sit down with them and find out what your strengths and weaknesses are, and never fail to disrespect those. And that's how it works for us. Can John, true. any comment on that? No, that no, no, that's true. Right. And, and also, as a couple, we have enough other things that we do separate from each other that we, you know, he's very active in sports. He's an endurance horse rider. Um, we have three dogs. We have three horses. I like to hike. I have a lot of people I hike with. Mm -hmm. um, so there's enough diversion that we have the right amount of time together for our business right. and personal life. Right. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. It's important to separate your, your personal life from your business life. You know, and we have some unspoken rules, 
probably around 7 p.m., we try to turn off our phones. Unless it's a certain client. Unless it's a certain client. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's them. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, we try to keep the conversation away from real estate, uh, but at the same time, it's a benefit knowing that if any of our clients uh, contact either one of us, they know that we've had conversations about their property and we'll know, we know it equally. So. And thank you. And Richard, I know you, you, uh, your wife is your business partner as well, but you all split the work very differently. Is that, could you share that with the crowd? Yes, my wife, my assistant, my boss, uh, she, she is brilliant behind the scenes. Uh, very good at marketing, computers, paperwork, uh, admin work. Uh, she loves that. She loves being in front of a computer with her golden retrievers next to her. Whereas I, I prefer to be freewheeling out there in the car, adventuring, talking, negotiating. Uh, that's definitely my strong suit. Paperwork is my weakness. So uh, it's a perfect collaboration. Yeah, great, and that's, I think there's no, there's no one way to do this. Richard, if you could um, share with the group, as we've talked about, there are agents who work pretty much exclusively a high-end or a luxury niche. What, however, that's defined in your marketplace which as we know, is defined very differently in, depending on the average price range of your marketplace. But however luxury is defined in your marketplace, there's some agents that work there exclusively, and then there are, are also agents who are very successful at handling, you know, do a broader price range of business, who handle maybe two or three luxury closings a year, but that's not uh, the entire focus of their business. And Richard, I know for you, this is, that's a little bit more of your business philosophy. Can you kind of share how you arrived at that and how that works, works for you and your business plan? Well, I certainly cover the full gamut. I, I enjoy the spontaneity of the business, the challenge of each day. Uh, I have no idea how it's going to start. I, I like as little structure as possible. And I do some, I dabble some in the luxury. Uh, and, and it's a nice diversion, but most of my attention is for the broad spectrum. But I would say that in this area specifically, again, people may buy a condo for their staff or for their uh, guests, and then they may, it, it's such a transitional marketplace. People are here trying on Palm Springs, and then they come back and, and upgrade and buy a significant property, again, as a part-time home. They'll be full-time while they're here for the three weeks or two months. But I, I, I can't stress enough how open-minded one must be for referrals. Uh, they can come from anywhere. Open houses are critical, and it's all about being open to people, being their neighbor, being their friend, and uh, being an ambassador to the community through the open houses. Right. We, can I touch on Yes, that? John, I was going to say, you were given some great insight on where, how you well, built your business. Before, before the, this panel today, we were all talking about open houses, and I strongly believe in open houses. I like to meet people and talk to people and interact with them one-on-one. -on -one. But coincidentally, he, doesn't have, he does not have a sign-in sheet, and I do not have a sign-in sheet. I never ask anybody to sign in. I'm there to have a conversation with them, give them comps in the neighborhood if they want it, and then let them spend their time in the house. I, if they want to talk to me, they can call me. I just, it's kind of like how I like to do it. Right. You, do, you do the same. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, one of the other things, John, you were talking about is, you know, we often think of past clients as sources of referrals and other agents as sources of referrals, but you've been very successful at developing other sources as well that have been important in building your business. True. Uh, from my time in LA, I know a lot of Los Angeles real estate agents, so I get quite a few, 80% of our business is agent or client referral. Uh, the other 20% is new business. But uh, in my past life with my former partner, he was an, uh, an interior designer of note, and I met a lot of interior designers. Well, those designers are very good friends of mine now <laughs> mm -hmm. because their clients buy and sell all the time. Um, one of them, uh, Sheldon Hart, he's a designer from Laguna Beach. One of his clients ended up buying a house through us for $36 million. It was just, he was with her and he said, Sue, call John. You like John, you met him at my house at Christmas parties, call him. So that resulted in a $36 million sale. They're selling that house now and she's looking for something smaller and she doesn't want to go over 30 million. <laughs> now that's LA. 
Uh, I don't do a lot of business in LA, but I, I will do it. Uh, 30, 30 million yeah. plus, yeah. We, we can be flexible, right? right. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a, it's a great story and something very interesting to know. Again, if you're wanting to move into the luxury market, you know, there are, look at where those people spend time and with whom they spend time. You know, and are those, do you have some of those in your sphere? Can you develop and uh, deepen those relationships? I think is a, is a, is a great, some great words of wisdom and strategy for people wanting to get in. So I think, um, Kat, if you're ready, Kat's going to lead us through and get, show you some examples of marketing strategy that they use and some of the materials they use. So I'm going to turn this and give that to Kat and let him... Uh, Is it green button? Green button. Okay. Green button. All right. Well, how should I start this? I guess I can say that we all know that marketing changes all the time. Uh, I don't think there's one proven method of what works and what doesn't work. Each one of you guys are in your own specific markets. You have your own social media outlets, uh, magazines, whatever you may have that works for your clientele and for the product that you're, uh, that you're selling. Your st uh, marketing strategy is gonna depend on your audience, your location, your product, and your price range. You know, uh, that's very important. So I'm gonna make it a little bit general as to what I use. I have a little system that I sort of uh, came up with. I, it's an acronym GAP, G-A-P. It's what is my goal for my marketing, my audience, and uh, the uh, purpose of my marketing. So it varies with every property, obviously, but generally I can say that my goals are usually to satisfy my client uh, and uh, to sell the property, obviously, and third, and equally as important, self-promotion. I highly believe in promoting ourselves as much as the property itself, because even though we need the property in order to make a living, the property also needs us. It needs our reputation, and our sellers have more confidence in us when they can read about us, when they can research us, and when we're out there visible. So it is as important as advertising the property. Uh, also, uh, without us promoting ourselves, uh, people won't be able to follow us on our live feeds or on our uh, uh, Twitter accounts or Facebook or anything else like that. So it's very, very critical for us to be out there. And there's a lot of stuff behind the scenes that goes on. And as technology changes, that evolves constantly. Uh, the way to get your word out there, the way it was five, two years ago, is now different just because of algorithms and all, how all that works. Um, a, uh, audience. Who is your audience when you're marketing? I mean, let's face it, marketing is expensive. So who is your audience? Uh, you have your people that need tangible material in their hands. They need magazines. They need glossy ads. They need to sit at a coffee table and flip through pages. Your traditionalists says dinosaurs, but same thing. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have your techies, uh, you know, your millennials. They'll sit there at 11 o'clock at night and search uh, all the social media sites, the, uh, and not just uh, your Zillows and your public uh, MLS domains, but also MLS blogs, um, uh, gossip pages, anything real estate related. Uh, that is a large part of our audience. Third, but not least, is you guys. Um, it's fellow realtors who do business in our price range, uh, realtors that have clients who want to refer clients to buy here in our market, in our vacation market. Uh, you are our number one audience because more times than not, you will bring the buyers to the listings that we have. I wish it would double end more, but it's just not the case. Uh, and fourth, and it's not listed on here, obviously, it's your past clientele and uh, personal context. So, um, oh, purpose, we forgot about purpose. That's gap. Uh, again, it goes very much in line with goals, exposure of your property, satisfying your seller, <coughs> and uh, self-promotion. Now, what I try to do then, uh, I try to come up with a marketing plan that fits all of these three letters of that acronym. Um, and um, let's see where this goes. 
All right, well, that leads us to tools. Each one of your companies, I'm sure, is inundating you with new tools and marketing gadgets and everything else to promote your properties and help you service your clients. The downside of that is a lot of times, myself included, I get lost in it. I just don't know where to fit these tools in, how they even work, what they do, and how to use them effectively. So if I can make a suggestion about all those great tools that are out there, sit down with your marketing coordinator at your company and talk to them. Hey, what is this new tool? How does it work? How can we implement that in my marketing plan? So um, only if you have a good vision as to what is available to you from your company, as well as what you're doing yourself, will you be able to create a checklist, which I know you can't see the details right now, but it is a very detailed <laughs> checklist that has a lot of items on there. It uh, has uh, a, a column, what Cobalt Banker brings to the table, as a column what I bring to the t uh, table, and then I go back to my gap system, goals, audience, and purpose, and I check off each particular item that is applicable to my marketing plan, to my acronym. And that's how I come up with the marketing plan that we have. You can see who runs our business. Hmm? You can see who runs our business. <laughs> <laughs> Hardly. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, I uh, forgot what the next slide is, but okay, well, uh, when it comes to print ads, and I don't know how many of you guys uh, believe in print ads, I know it is sort of becoming a little dying art with many realtors, uh, I think it is still as effective and as important to have your properties and yourselves in print ads, but be specific. Who are you, what are you choosing? What kind of print uh, are you choosing? What kind of magazine are you choosing? This one, for example, was Art Patron Magazine. A lot of our clients come from, uh, they're members of museums and theaters, etc. And the Art Patron Magazine caters to the Palm Springs Art Museum, Laguna Art Museum, and it's specifically to those people. And that one ran in the McCallum Annual Magazine, too. Right, yeah. exactly. So. Um, this particular property was the Elrod house that we sold, uh, Lautner Elrod. Well, John Lautner was the architect. It was built in the 60s for Arthur Elrod. It's here at Southridge in Palm Springs. It was a trophy property to list and sell. We, and um, Jeremy Scott, I didn't even know who he was. He's a, a clothing designer. And um, I Googled him before he came out to look at the house. I thought, oh my god. <laughs> I was, you just Google Jeremy Scott. Um, but when he got there, he's the nicest kindest man I've ever met, great guy. So we're happy he got that house. Yeah, uh, you, you might know the house, I'm sure. It's also known as the... Um, Diamonds uh, Are Forever. Diamonds Are Forever house, yeah. yeah, the James Bond house. 007. Yeah, and uh, when we go print, uh, we go all out. So uh, two pages, double pages. Uh, this was a house that we listed for six and a half million, and our seller, Rightfully so, she wanted her house to be seen in the best possible way that she felt her house should be represented. So, uh, Palm Springs Life magazine, for us locally here, that's the premier magazine uh, in terms of visibility, appeal, quality, everything else. That's where we advertise. There are a lot of other magazines as well that just don't work for our market and our clients. So be specific as to who you choose um, in terms of running your ads. Um, Can I add something to that too? Another thing that, that not everybody realizes, including our sellers, is that when we, like that last house that, that Kat just showed you, um, our photo shoot and drone was $7,000 for, that, for that, uh, that house alone. And that's a $1,400 ad that we ran for a few months in a row. So it, it's expensive to do, mm. but it, it pays off. And, and a lot of our clients are my age or older, and they still look at print, so that's why we do print. Yeah. And, uh, well, and those are just additional examples. Uh, View Magazine, it's, uh, you know, it is uh, being distributed to all the zip codes uh, in Southern California, and people read it. It's an insert in the paper. This is a new listing we have, $6.2 million. What is it? <laughs> it's a, a new listing we have. It is, yes, yes. Yeah. it's a new listing. It's, actually, we sold that listing a couple of years ago and now we have it back again. Yeah. So, um, 
And uh, that's, uh, that's how I base our marketing uh, based on what are your goals, your audience, and your purpose. And you guys know what your outlets are and what your tools are. And if you follow that kind of format, that might help. So. Wonderful. But, you know, I think you can all see just from the, our short time together today why these three gentlemen are so successful, not just in overall real estate, but in the luxury community here in the Coachella Valley and in Palm Springs. So if you would join me in thanking them for their time and, and their expertise. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah. And, and the only thing um, we want to leave you with, and it's certainly, you know, again, a recurring theme from this morning, but in terms of Caldwell Banker and their commitment to diversity and inclusion, you know, my own personal story, and I joined a, a real estate industry 25 years ago, is for those of us that are of a little bit more advanced age, we know things were very different. And it was, I was very, even the company I joined then, that wasn't Caldwell Banker for the next five years, but became Caldwell Banker in five years. You know, there was a culture of acceptance. Uh, it was a culture of I knew that I could build a career there. And that's certainly been very important to me and continues to today. And so I'm very, very proud to be associated with an organization both at the Realogy parent company level and at Cobble Banker at the brand level and all the other Realogy brands um, that has had inclusiveness and diversity as part of their core values, quite frankly, from almost the beginning of their, of their existence in the business. And certainly it's not something they've come lately to. So we're very proud to be a part of this incredible organization. Hopefully you uh, found some value in our presentation today, and we look forward to being uh, an important part of this uh, gathering of professionals uh, for many, many years to come. So thank you for your time. Can I, can I, can I ask a quick question? Sure, sure. sure. So I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to stop you, but a quick question, please. Um, as you can see, Kat does the marketing. He really is the guts of what we do. and. I'm the dinosaur in this, but his challenge to me was to build up our Instagram account. Hashtag Nelson Mo Properties, please. All right. I don't I don't think you're all dinosaur, John. I think you're getting with it, so it's great. It's great. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.